Good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to the uh, last of our 21-22 um, uh, winter meetings. Um, tonight, we've got uh, John Hart, as you can see on Zoom, um, from Cotswold Archaeology. Uh, John is, was intending to come here physically to do the presentation, and in fact, he wanted to come to do, do the presentation physically, apparently to avoid his children, who he thought might disturb him <laughs> in the background. At least that's what he told me. Um, so John's uh, been working with in archaeology since 1995, uh, directed numerous large excavations, and is now the senior publications officer for Cotswold Archaeology, uh, where he manages and undertakes post-excavation analysis and publication. So his talk tonight is entitled Discovering the Unexpected 10,000 Years of Settlement and Ritual Along the Milford Haven to Turley Gas Pipeline, Turley being in Gloucestershire, of course, which is the connection to why he's here. So anyway, over to you, John. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I realise I should have sh uh, chosen a much snappier title. That seemed to uh, go on for quite a while. We, uh, we've actually published a book which we've called Timeline in a true archaeological tradition. There's a, there are a lot of books published on pipelines or road schemes, and they're all called some variation on timeline or a line through time. So uh, we followed along in that tradition. Um, I'm going to talk about sites that we've found after sort of briefly introducing the project itself. Um, if you're interested in any of the sites in particular, you can go to our website. There'll be a, a link on the final slide and you can actually look at uh, each individual site report uh, all, all free via our website. And there is a publication to go with it as well, which which I was intending to bring along at uh, a reduced price. But uh, unfortunately, that wasn't to be. As my, uh, as my car decided, but it is available via Oxbow. So there's a, a little plug there. I don't get any royalties. So um, the South Wales gas pipeline, uh, quite topical at the moment with, uh, with energy supply and all the things that are going on in the news. Um, this has actually been a, a long time in coming, um, especially as a, an archeological scheme. Um, we first started in 2004 on the project and the uh, final publication was in 2020. Uh, to give a sort of sense of scale of that, when I, I first started on the project, I was a sort of young, free and single project officer, and I now have five daughters. So, uh, you know, quite a big change. And a lot of the people that worked on the project as archaeologists um, began as diggers and are now managing their own projects, their own large scale schemes. So it's uh, it's been a learning curve and it's, uh, it's thrown up a lot of really good archaeology, as uh, hopefully you'll get to see in the next uh, hour or so, well, hour. Right, on with the show. So uh, a bit of background, uh, it's important to understand why we were there and uh, how we went about things. It's uh, a massive in infrastructure project, uh, 317 kilometres long, um, gas is shipped in via these big container ships in liquefied form to Milford Haven. At what they call these AGIs, above ground installations, where it's uh, converted and then it's pumped along the pipeline, which here is shown above ground, but it is buried, um, all the way into Turley in Gloucestershire. And from there, it connects to the, uh, the main grid and spreads out to businesses and private homes. Um, you'll probably be relieved to know that it's actually Qatari gas, not from uh, any uh, less reputable suppliers uh, uh, towards the east uh, and apparently it can supply about 20% of our gas needs so it, it's a massive massive project. Uh, in terms of staffing I mean almost every vehicle that you saw on the roads at that time seemed to have something to do with the project and there were people from all over Europe and I, I believe Canada as well um, who came on to work on this, not, not just as archaeologists, but um, uh, specialists working along the uh, construction itself. Um, in the bottom picture there, you see the pipe laid in a trench uh, and the welding to do that is, is extremely specialised, has to be a flexible weld. And I think the welders came from Germany and Holland uh, and were very, very well paid, far better paid than archaeologists. Um, if you look again at the bottom slide as well, it's useful to uh, just see the width of what we call the easement. So that's the area in terms of width that's stripped to lay the pipeline. Um, the pipeline itself goes into a trench on the side of the easement and then that's all backfilled. But the easement itself allows vehicles to run along 
the length of the pipeline without trashing all the topsoil so that then the topsoil can be reinstated and the farmland can go back to uh, what it was uh, before. And in, in a year or so, you, you don't know the pipelines there really. Um, uh, the significance of that in archaeological terms is that basically we've got one 317 kilometre long, about 20 metre wide evaluation trench. Um, so it's important to bear in mind that we're do dealing with a very long length, but quite a narrow width. So uh, most of the sites that we exposed, very exciting, but we only exposed part of them. Uh, one last point, it, it actually falls outside the uh, the normal planning system that we as uh, as uh, professional archaeologists tend to be involved with. So uh, if you want to build a new housing scheme or a new supermarket, you have to go through the planning system, which is probably familiar to most of us. Um, but national schemes like this, big infrastructure projects, nuclear power stations, for example, big road schemes, uh, and, and these pipeline schemes fall outside that. But the uh, the people running them, these sort of quangos, national grid, have their own policies, which, which in effect are exactly the same as the planning system. And that's where we come in. We come in to uh, record the archaeology that they're going to impact on. So it was built in three sections in the direction of the gas flow, which is west to east. So Milford Haven over here in the west, this orange section, and then a central section which skirted the Brecon Beacons, and then a final section which then took it over the Severn and into Turley in Gloucestershire. Um, it, it was quite a complex project and it involved as a range of contractors that changed for every section. Uh, Cotswold Archaeology and um, another um, archaeological uh, unit, Cape Cambrian Archaeological Projects, based in Wales, did the, uh, the westernmost section. Uh, Cotswold Archaeology acting alone did the central section and then colleagues from Network Archaeology did the uh, easternmost section. Um, I was involved in uh, all stages of the work uh, but I'm most familiar with the uh, the western, the Welsh, the Welsh, the two Welsh sections here that, so that's really what I'm going to be talking about most of all and that is where most of the discoveries were made as it happens. Um, the picture down here is uh, the section along the Brecon Beacons uh, I've put it in just because it's, uh, it, it's of interest because that part of the route, if anyone's familiar with the Brecon Beacons, is a, a triple SI, so that's a site of special scientific interest. It means that uh, basically you can't drive over there. Um, normally we drive all our, all our kit up, we'd uh, drive people to, uh, to site cabins for their lunch break so they could get warm again. Um, that wasn't possible here, so everything had to be portaged up from the bottom of the mountain. Um, if people wanted loo breaks, then back down the mountain they went. Uh, and at the end of the day, everything had to be carried back. We couldn't leave anything on site. Um, just added a bit of uh, extra interest to, uh, to what people were doing, uh, another, another sort of difficulty. Obviously here, it's uh, in the slide, it's quite sort of decent weather, but uh, it has been known to rain in Wales. And, um, you know, it was a case of tough, really. Uh, they, were, they were issued with decent waterproofs, but... Uh, you know, if it rained, it rained, and it can get pretty bleak up on the on the Breckens if uh, if you have adverse weather. Um, so it was a very long project. Uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, sort of life changes that I personally experienced during the, uh, the progression of the project. Um, I began um, in two thousand and four on this particular project, uh, doing field reconnaissance. But the actual work itself began with desk-based assessments, which are just a way of assessing the known archaeology. And that was done for the entire route in, a, I think, a 200 metre corridor either side of the central line. So that looked at every single known historic environment record, historic maps, aerial photographs, uh, and generated absolutely massive documents, the sort of documents you, you can't possibly print off because you couldn't carry them. You got nowhere to store them. Um, and then following on from that, we had a field reconnaissance survey during which myself and some colleagues walked over every single field along that uh, 317 kilometre length. Uh, I think we were chased by pretty much every single cow in southern Wales, uh, a few bulls uh, and a few irate farmers as well. We did have permission to, to tra travel on their land, but, uh, uh, you know, these, uh, these things happen. Um, we were looking for sort of lumps and bumps, anything that sort of stuck out that wasn't previously recorded. Um, 
geophysical, geophysical survey followed along from that along the entire route uh, and then evaluation trenches so it's a very familiar sequence uh, here in, in here in the top somebody's doing a field reconnaissance survey on on the, on the Breckens up at a trig point We've got a very nicely placed evaluation trench somewhere somewhere in Wales I think and then of course onto the uh, the excavation down here uh, many we did many of those along the route that just gives a flavor of a, a typical um, fairly nondescript site but with a, a very nice view um, one thing we did have to do was uh, various reroutes so every time the pipeline encountered a problem like uh, uh, a heritage site that it couldn't have, that it needed to avoid or a uh, environmental consideration or a, an engineering constraint it had to be rerouted and then all the top sort of stages had to be uh, repeated until finally a decent route was arrived at. Um, so as well as the excavations, we also undertook a, an absolutely massive paleo-environmental sampling um, scheme along the entire route. So samples were taken, uh, soil samples were taken from all the uh, excavation sites we undertook, but there were also a, a whole series of boreholes all the way along the route. Um, from which column samples were taken and they contained charcoal and um, in some cases pollen which could then be radiocarbon dated and that's going to be the subject of, a, of its own monograph which uh, I believe is forthcoming uh, and uh, it, it's a, a very major piece of work which spans the Mesolithic right the way through to the modern period uh, it's very very detailed I think it's one of the most detailed environmental recording schemes uh, in archaeology and in South Wales certainly uh, and following on from that, a big uh, a big stage of assessment and publication in which all the records were looked at, analysed, all the different sort of data types that we uh, we threw up were, were pulled in together and analysed in relation to one another. And that enabled us to publish each individual site, um, which are available as great literature, great literature reports on our website. Uh, and then summarised in... Um, in a, a smaller book, which uh, which is the one available from Oxbow. And last but not least, uh, archive deposition. Very important in archaeology, not very glamorous, but uh, it means that all our records are available for researchers or interested members of the public to, to look at, along with the finds. So, now to the good stuff. Um, I'm going to run through in uh, chronolog chronological order all of the major sites that we found. There's no way of uh, doing it site by site, so really I'm going to look at, uh, at highlights. Um, there will be time for questions at the end if anybody wants to know anything more about uh, an individual site, um, please free, feel free to ask. So the earliest stuff we found, Paleolithic. Um, so this is, uh, this is pre-modern humans into the earliest hum modern humans, and we're talking about the time when uh, there's still an ice age, um, South Wales and Southern Britain are intermittently habitable, so you've got you've got people crossing into those areas episodically as the ice sheets retreat. Um, unsurprisingly, remains from that period are extremely sparse, and and we found almost nothing. A um, couple of flints amounted to everything from the uh, Paleolithic. Um, the Mesolithic is a, a slightly later period. This this top map here uh, is a reminder that during part of that period as the as the ice sheets um, retreated but still locked up a lot of water. Um, Britain was still attached to the continent via this sort of wedge of land that's under the channel in the North Sea. So um, populations would have been able to cross not only from there but uh, from further afield across there into southern Britain and Wales. Uh, and they would have been hunter-gatherer groups uh, very much as, as you might imagine hunter-gatherer groups to, uh, to be you know very sparsely populated in, in, in terms of numbers but they're looking at a, a range of resources uh, which which southern Wales would supply very at you know very well uh, coasts rivers woodland and all the rest of it um, from that period we found just a handful of flints uh, sparsely sort of distributed along the uh, along the pipeline none of them were in uh, features of Mesolithic date they were all uh, found either in the subsoil, just as things that have been ploughed up, or or in late, much later features, you know, demonstrably later features. 
But what we did also find was um, charcoal and charred remains from, from that period. So believe it or not, things like uh, charred hazelnut shells survive very, very well. Um, you know, we, we radiocarbon dated some to 8,000 years BC, that sort of, that sort of time frame. And uh, using that and these pollen samples that I talked about earlier, tied in with radiocarbon dating, we were able to build up a picture of the changing environment and the, uh, the sort of faunal and floral successions that had built up. Um, the bottom slide shows what uh, a sort of upland landscape might have looked like in the, in the sort of later part of the Mesolithic. So sort of birch trees, that sort of thing. And in the, um, the sort of more lowland areas, you'd have culminated in, in a deciduous woodland that would have blanketed much of the lowland. Sometimes that's uh, called the Great Wildwood, and it persists into the uh, Neolithic period, which we'll come on to now. So um, I'm going to look at uh, three parts of the Neolithic, um, early, middle and late. I've, I've put dates there for, for anyone who's interested, but, but really, I mean, it's just a, a, a handy way of, uh, of archaeologists sort of annotating what we're talking about. So early Neolithic, we're talking about the, the introduction of farmers and the first sort of fairly sedentary settlements. Um, and uh, we're talking about sort of family size groups here. We're not talking about a sort of stratified chieftain type society. It's fairly egalitarian from what we can tell. People are living in clearings in, in the great wild woods. So here's a reconstruction drawing we did for a pamphlet that we published for schools in the Brecon Beacons based on the pipeline discoveries. Um, it shows a, you know, an imagining of a, a Neolithic house, various activities, you know, sort of fire there. It's a, it's a mixed sort of uh, mixed economy of herding, small scale arable, uh, plus hunting and gathering um, is, is still going on. There, there's debate in archaeology over to the sort of relative importance of all these different aspects, but uh, essentially it's a very mixed economy. But you are seeing the uh, construction of houses, which sees the first fairly sort of sedentary lifestyles. And I, you know, we don't know how long these houses lasted for, but you know, let, let's just say, for example, uh, uh, one or two generations. Um, unsurprisingly, from uh, that time, uh, that, that long ago, they're pretty, pretty rare discoveries, but they are being thrown up in increasing numbers by development led archaeology such as this. We actually found three examples along the pipeline, which is, you know, an, you know, a, an amazing discovery, really. And um, we just wouldn't expect to find one, let alone three. Um, you can probably see from these comparative plans that they don't survive in any particularly spectacular form. The uh, three that we found are these three here. One of them, I believe it's that one, is actually on a, an Iron Age site, which we'll talk about later. Um, so there's a mixture of post holes there that had to be unpicked, mainly through radiocarbon dating, but also through uh, uh, pottery for the Neolithic period. Um, uh, and the other type of evidence we find from that period are uh, pits. So we, we found three, three houses, but most of the sites, and we found 24 of them along the length of the pipeline of this period, mostly in, in, west, in the uh, western sections, so the Welsh sections. Um, most of them were pit clusters, which essentially are groups of uh, very small, very undramatic pits, you know, size of a dinner plate, you know, uh, 10, 10, 20 centimetres deep. Uh, they tend to be, they tend to have sort of bits of charcoal, possibly animal bone if you're lucky, but not in Wales because animal bone generally doesn't survive well in Wales. Um, pottery if you're lucky, and that's about it. Um, we don't really know what they're for, why they were dug, but there are various sort of um, theories, mainly, mainly suggesting that they are dug to commemorate episodes of, uh, of occupation. So um, this house in the woods, if you imagine it being occupied for a, a generation perhaps, uh, and then moving away elsewhere, perhaps if they've exhausted the, the soil or, or there might be cultural reasons they'd want to move, um, they then dug these pits. And the, the theory is they cast sort of handfuls of domestic waste into these pit, pits, which they then covered up. And eventually they'd return to these sites, um, you know, general generation or so later. And we do know that they return to these sites again and again, um, both from radiocarbon dating 
along the pipeline, but also more, more uh, further afield. So across these sort of sites are, are present across Britain, and, and again and again, these they, they are returned to as demonstrated by radiocarbon dating and returned to often, you know, across an absolutely vast period of time, hundreds, sometimes, you know, a thousand years. So we found 24 early Neolithic sites, which um, which in archaeological terms is, is absolutely great. You know, really, you know, early Neolithic Southern Wales was pretty sparsely populated before this, uh, yeah, as far as we knew before before this project, but uh, we were finding sites, you know, all the time. And there are probably more. These are the dated sites. So there are plenty of undated sites, which are probably of this period as well. You know, we just can't prove it. There's a there's a limit to the number of radiocarbon dates we can actually take. So then we come to the slightly later middle Neolithic period. And uh, in contrast to that 24, that number of 24 sites, we found three. So there's a a huge drop, a huge fall in the number of sites. And that's uh, that's a picture that's mirrored across Britain. And we think the reason for that is that uh, instead of these sort of semi-sedentary mixed farming communities, we now have uh, mobile pastoralists. So they're, they're farming animals, they're moving around with them, they're herdsmen. Uh, and they, they are not really creating houses that we could, certainly not that we can find archeologically, uh, nothing, I know of that survived from that period, so certainly not along the uh, the pipeline. But they are digging these pit sites again. Um, we've got one here, and you can see from the photos that these pits are completely unspectacular. They're you know, if the plough had gone slightly deeper, they'd they'd have gone, um, and that's that's pretty typical of this this class of feature. But but looking at the radiocarbon dates, which are these numbers in red, you don't have to worry about the actual values. But you can see we've taken three. Um, we sort of speculated, and it is a degree of speculation, that they, the pits were paired, so we've suggested some pairs there, and they progressed along here, and I think it's a, you know, it's a period of about a thousand years or so for that progression, and uh, you need to bear in mind that the, uh, the pipeline was only 20 metres wide, so then we're, we're looking at a potentially just a, a small slither of a, of a wider group of pits. Um, in terms of what we found, in these pits, it's mainly charcoal, that's what allows us to date them, and little scraps of pottery. There's a little drawing of one there, you know, thumbnail sized scraps, not, not much at all. And then we move on to the late Neolithic, which uh, brings us to our first star find. So the, uh, the, the Neolithic pits and the houses are absolutely great finds. Um, the value lies in the, uh, the frequency with which we found them. Um, there are some sites along the pipeline, which are individually sort of spectacular. Uh, and this is one of them. It's uh, a, late, a late Neolithic henge. So, you know, uh, related to Stonehenge or Avebury or all the other henges that you might uh, have visited over the years. Um, there's a photograph of it here. You can see some of our staff standing in the sections we've dug across it. Uh, gives you a sense of scale. So it's at the smaller end of, of henges. I, th I think it's about 20 meters across there. The ditch is about five meters wide originally, but it had eroded another three or so meters to about eight meters in width. And it was about uh, one and a half to two and a half meters deep, cut into the rock. It's, uh, it's located on a, a ridge overlooking a couple of very steeply cut river valleys. And it's a ridge that was in use for a long time. We did a, another project there um, a few years later along the road bypass scheme we found a, a huge funerary and ritual site that's the St Clair to Red Roses site just a, a couple of hundred meters away from this henge uh, it was slightly later but you could see that the same location had attracted people over uh, you know a long duration and, and that's something we'll come back to with this henge in particular. In terms of what it looked like it was these two sort of banana shaped rock cut ditches Based on comparison with other henges, they'd have had a bank along along the outside. Excuse me, they'd have had a bank along the outside, and then inside, originally not in the ditches, but the ditches have eroded. Inside are these post settings here, which contained big packing stones, and they would have supported either upright timber posts or stones. And it is aligned 
Um, obviously, we we always talk about uh, celestial alignments. It's aligned on um, to to mark the um, the summer and the and the winter solstice. So the way we we excavated it was to put several sections across it, as you can see a couple of people doing here. They've this is a a slot through the fills. You can see the sort of stonier fills, which we think came from the bank that was cast up, uh, and the sort of finer silting sills, silting fills here. And there's a section drawing, uh, I think, of the same section. The red numbers again are our radiocarbon dates, so you can see how we build up a a fairly good picture of uh, of how it filled over time, and it filled very slowly. It was certainly visible in the Roman period, as we'll, we'll come on to. It wasn't visible at the time the pipeline uh, went across. Uh, it's not shown on any historic mapping. So certainly by the sort of post-medieval period, it had been levelled by ploughing and, you know, been forgotten about. There's no, no record that we can find of it at all. Um, unfortunately, the pipeline um, was unable to be rerouted by the time we discovered this, this, this brand new henge. So... Uh, uh, sadly, it was a victim to the pipeline, but we did do an, a, a very sort of thorough record of it. So it's uh, it's the the jargon is preservation by record, which is what happened in this case. Um, so that's uh, that's late, late Neolithic, and and during this time, we're we're still talking about probably about semi-mobile pastoralists who who also cultivated a few crops. Um, and we, you know, the, these sort of henge monuments, we think they're they're central places for for these um, these societies who are presumably related by kin or by by cultural tradition. Again, we're not really talking about highly stratified societies. It's it's fairly egalitarian. Um, as as we found, uh, only three sites from the Middle Neolithic. Um, we're, we're we're up again in the Late Neolithic to about nine sites, most of which are these uh, pit clusters again, but also the Henge. And, uh, and something called a burnt mound, which we'll talk more about uh, in future slides. So the, um, that's the Neolithic. Um, we now come on to the uh, what's known as the Beaker and Charcolithic periods. So we're talking about the, the very end of the Neolithic and the beginning of the Bronze Age. This is the introduction of, of metalwork to Britain and, uh, and of very significant cultural changes. It's a real watershed moment in British history. Um, when I first started in archaeology, I'd never heard of ADNA, ancient DNA, um, but we now do it not quite routinely, but we're doing it on a lot of sites. So this is looking at um, the ancient DNA uh, of human remains and trying to trace um, family relationships and also uh, ancestry. And uh, ADNA analysis for this period is suggesting at the moment that uh, there were populations migrating from the Rhine Valley. They'd originally come from Iberia, moved to the Rhine Valley, and uh, then some of them had come to Britain. And um, what we don't know is what had happened to the indigenous population. Um, it's possible that there was um, interpersonal violence, war, conflict, or equally possible there was um, you know, disease, and we know from uh, historical sources that that can be absolutely devastating to uh, to local populations or it may be that they interbred quite happily or coexisted we don't know yet but uh, hopefully you know a few years time where uh, technology will move on and we'll we'll know more um so these people were uh, th their economy was based on a mixture of farming and hunter gathering there's a sort of very new a renewed interest in funerary monuments. I mean, that would have been something in the early Neolithic with, with long barrows. Um, you know, we, we're familiar here with all the Cotswold seven long barrows. Um, but now, now we've got this sort of renew, renewed interest and we see the we see sort of round barrows. This is a, a site that we excavated at uh, Tricastle. Again, it's on a ridge and it's at the end of a long straggling barrow cemetery, most of which are upstanding. This one wasn't. Um, we uh, we found 20 sites of this period, so it's a, you know, a huge number and uh, a remarkable discovery. Uh, and it does see the first use of the Brecon Beacon, so the uplands of sort of Minif Mudfi, that sort of area. And that reflects uh, climate change to, to warmer weather. So we're looking at a, you know, uh, a few degrees warmer than it is today. You know, you could, you could live up on 
Minif Mudvai, you could farm up there. Um, we didn't find any direct evidence of that from this period, but we certainly did from the Iron Age, which we'll come on to later. Now, again, it, it was mostly pit sites. So again, these small, very nondescript pits, but we think reflective of, of settlement. Uh, and cremation cemeteries. So that uh, that ridge with the henge was used for a cremation cemetery, um, which we found along the pipeline route, but also uh, along that St. Clair's to Red Roses road scheme. So uh, quite, quite intense burials there. Um, and I'm sure they were deliberately referencing the henge. Now we think at this time, based on the radiocarbon dating, that this is when the henge started to be backfilled deliberately. Those big stones in the fill in the section of fill that were visible in the photograph almost certainly came from a bank and they were quite they were fairly loose even though they'd be in the ground for you know several thousand years they were fairly loose there were gaps between them and it had the impression that they'd been they'd been chucked in um, so this reflects the this sort of cultural change and, and a change in sort of spiritual beliefs so they were either deliberately slighting the henge or they were perhaps you know conceivably even even burying it with um, you know, with, with a degree of care. You know, both are equally possible. And what we see here is a, a funerary monument at Tricastle, so it's the end of this straggling row of uh, barrows, most of which are visible. As I say, this one wasn't, it was an unexpected discovery. Uh, it's a, a ring ditch, so you can just, it's large, been largely excavated here, so you can just see it's a, a very shallow ditch. As far as we could tell, there was no bank or palisade or mound associated with it. So it's uh, basically a ditch with several features inside it, one of which was a large pit, and I, I think it was this one, which contained this uh, remarkable find here, which is a, a bronze, well, sorry, a copper uh, halberd head with, incredibly, uh, the wood from the haft still attached, which allowed us to um, uh, investigate it very closely. We could identify the wood type and so on. Um, and looking at <clears throat> other finds from the pit, we could uh, radiocarbon date it as well. <coughs> um, this this object is of uh, international significance and has been studied very closely. There's a detailed report in the Proceedings of the Prehistoric Society. Um, it's it's actually shows Irish cultural influences. Um, so here we are in Wales, but it's a reminder that uh, we, you know, uh, it's not it's not isolated at all. This is uh, they're looking at long distributions, either directly or, or passing items on, and presumably it's not just items; it's people, it's ideas, and all the rest of it. Um, these little rock art pictures, which uh, are from somewhere on the continent, I can't remember where, show you sort of roughly how these things might have been used. Um, and these people sort of jollily dancing away, but uh, you have to imagine they're they're not they're not weapons, although they look like weapons. They're they're um, they're ceremonial. They're they're prestige items. And in contrast to the uh, Neolithic, we are now looking at a, a stratified society as you know, almost not not quite personified, but uh, you know, evidenced by these these sort of objects, these big prestige objects. Um, now this this was buried in the centre of pretty much the centre of the, the ring ditch, but there wasn't a body there. So <clears throat> um, it may, may be that this was a, a cenotaph, perhaps um, somebody died elsewhere or it's it, the object needed to be buried for some reason. But there were human remains buried in the ditch along here. And they radiocarbon dating showed that they were buried a few hundred years later on. So this, uh, this, this ring ditch, very slight, uh, remained in the sort of cultural memory and people visited a couple of centuries later and buried at least three individuals in the ditch. There was another big hole here and it almost certainly held a, a large upright post. So uh, slight as the ditch was, it was probably highly visible. I mean, you know, these posts can actually last uh, a surprising amount of time and of course they, they can be replaced. Uh, and we found uh, another very similar monument on a, on a slightly larger scale, uh, a bit further along the pipeline at Stainton. So again, this is another enclosed funerary mon monument. It's a complete ring ditch. You can see all the little sections we've dug across it, and there it is in, in plan. Unfortunately, the northern 
two thirds here had already been truncated by past activity. So just beyond where this uh, person's laying out the uh, the ranging rod, that's all been sort of truncated away. So we've we've lost what was in the interior, but the um, the remaining third had about I think it was twenty three. The remains of twenty three individuals, most of whom were interred in these uh, these ceramic vessels, um, which were either upright or upside down. Um, and in one case, were um, there was no vessel, but the uh, the the burnt bone. Uh, they're all cremated remains. The burnt bone was uh, very tightly packed, suggesting it was in a an organic container, a leather bag or uh, a reed bag, some something of that sort. Um, so, so we excavated that. We did very detailed analysis of the human remains and uh, uh, again radiocarbon dating, and threw up lots of uh, lots of sort of interesting uh, snippets into into the population. Uh, it fits very well with the broader picture across across Britain. So um, we found about twenty three people. Um, that's in the southern third. If that was replicated across the rest, then I guess you know. 40 to 60 individuals. Um, the, the age range was what you'd expect for a population of that period. So, uh, so you know, a, a bias towards younger people, which, which you, you expect in a pre-modern population. We couldn't, I don't think we could uh, sex the remains because of the, um, the, the fragmentation of the bone, but uh, there were, there were some interesting things. Um, there was a, a evidence for mummification. There was a, um, some of the some of the remains had either been stored prior to burial or had been exhumed and other remains added to them. We could tell that by the difference in the radiocarbon dating. Uh, and it's also interesting to note that uh, in all of these cases, only a fraction of the cremated remain human remains were actually buried. And that's that's typical for the um, for the Bronze Age. Um, you you only get uh, even even allowing for truncation you only get a, a sort of small fraction of the uh, the human remains we don't know what happened to to the rest but you know possibilities include that they were um uh, given away to family members as, as heirlooms or you know kept in jars on the mantelpiece um even added to pottery as temper or turned into you know you can grind it up make a pigment turn it into memorial tattoos we can use the bone as amulets um all seems very macabre to to us but um to to them it may have been a way of keeping um, treasured loved ones within their community um it's probably you know they you know they would probably perhaps have seen it no different uh, to keeping a, a photograph of a, a past family member I'm just going to switch uh, our light on. It's very dark. There we go. Right. I'm uh, going to whiz through the Bronze Age. Um, so we found remains dating to the early Middle and, and Late Bronze Age, um, but they were sort of fairly similar. So I can I can group those all together. Uh, very few settlement sites. <coughs> Again, that that mirrors the the uh, picture across Britain. Um, we're talking about semi-mobile pastoralists at this time. Um, what we did find were these, these class of features I've mentioned before, burnt mounds. And here's, uh, here's one such, which is just along the pipeline route from Milford Haven. Milford Haven is just a few kilometers up the top left of that picture. Um, this is found during, a, during watching brief. So we had, uh, we had a lot of excavation sites. And in between the excavation sites, every single inch of the pipeline was monitored by um, by archaeologists uh, during a watching brief. And uh, somebody very vigilant here found uh, found this trough. That's that object there, which you can see in the lower picture. Uh, and it was inches below. You can see the the reeds of a marsh. It was it was you know you could poke your fingers through the top and touch the wood. And it was, uh, you know, because of that, we assumed it was fairly recent, but we sent a sample off for radiocarbon dating, got a, a rapid date on it. You, you can pay extra to get a, a rapid turnaround, which we did. And it turned out to our surprise to be Bronze Age. So, of course, work was halted and we, well, work was already halted, but uh, it turned into an excavation site. Uh, in fact, I, I machined this area. Burnt mounds are quite interesting to 
to, to strip with a machine because uh, because they're um, mound shaped it makes it quite difficult i i developed a technique We've, we found about 40 mounds along the bike line i developed a technique where i sort of cleared a route along there or got the the driver to clear a route along there then he could sort of sit in the middle machine around himself and then finally clear a route back out again um which proved to be sort of very effective um anyway so um burnt mounds we found about 40 of them we've actually written a, an article just about those the, the ones along the pipeline which is uh, available in uh, uh, welsh uh, archaeological journal archaeologia cambrensis um so um, and then they're also detailed in the individual site reports which you can get via our our uh, reports online page on the website which uh, the link will be at the end of the the lecture um that we found them in the way the main almost all in in the welsh section and very predictably every time the pipeline crossed the crossed a stream of which there were numerous um you know you could almost say you, you guarantee to find one so we're talking about a 20 meter width pipeline you know you spread that out across the wider landscape there must be thousands and thousands of these things scattered around this was the best pre preserved example I and mean, it sort of shows all the, the key elements of a burnt man so you've got the trough here which in this case is hewn out of a, a single oak <coughs> single oak um, trunk um, most of the troughs we found and this is typical of burnt mounds are just holes in the ground sometimes they're lined with clay but usually it's just relying on the um, the substrate to, to retain any water and um, behind the trough slightly up <coughs> uphill from the um, the water as a stone lined hearth and behind that again is the the mound itself and they're, they're almost all located next to water sources there are some that are uh, that aren't um, but we think they they relied on catching surface water <coughs> um we know how they worked so um cobble sized stones were heated on the hearth water was gathered from the, uh, the water source put in put in the trough hot stones were put in the into the water and that created either hot water or steam or both and then the cobbles could be reheated on the hearth and reused again and again until they shattered and then they were cast behind along with any sort of rakings out from the hearth to create this very distinctive burnt mound <coughs> which is made up of largely of a sort of fire shattered stones with sort of ash and charcoal um, for archaeologists, they're very, very boring to dig because you don't find anything with them. You know, the occasional flint, the occasional bit of animal bone, but but that's it. Um, they're very, very sterile. But they are, to me, I, I certainly find them fascinating because um, what we don't know is is what they did. We don't know why they were built. Um, there, there are all sorts of theories. Um, one of the most popular ones is that uh, they were used for cooking large joints of meat. Um, and experimental archaeology has shown that they they are very effective for doing that. So you you know you're boiling you know, large joints of meat such as you would use for feasting. Um, set against that is the fact that you don't tend to get any animal bone there. But this is Wales, and uh, animal bone doesn't survive very well anyway. Um, my my reason for suspecting that not to be the case is that these are quite often or typically located quite a way from any settlements so uh, you know you could be feasting there i suppose but uh, if you were talking about taking food back to a settlement it doesn't seem all that practical or all that desirable part of uh, part of a feast i suppose is seeing and smelling and hearing the food being cooked <coughs> uh, another theory is that they're used as um <clears throat> as saunas so some of them have these or have as in this case in fact have post holes and uh, stake holes around them which could support these sort of lightweight bender structures and these are certainly used in other cultures um, the Lakota Sioux use uh, uh, certainly in historical times have used saunas in coming of age ceremonies uh, they it's used as a test of endurance uh, sometimes in conjunction with sort of hallucinogens or extreme alcohol uh, uh, use uh, and that that does fit well with their sort of remote location um, and it's possible I, I sort of speculated that uh, it's possible that the burnt mound itself although it's a waste heap is actually deliberately encouraged 
uh, and that way it creates a sort of sense of otherness. You've got this sort of dark black red substrate. Sometimes it will show you through. Of course, you'll get vegetation growth on it, but it will certainly feel different underfoot. Uh, other possibilities are that they use for brewing, um, dyeing, um, textile manufacture. Um, but none of these, none of these sort of theories, including the one I favour, which is the sauna favour, uh, uh, the sauna theory. Um, none of these have any evidence, really. So it's, you know, pick, pick the one you like most, really. And perhaps archaeology in, in future years will create uh, techniques which can uh, kind of finally answer what they're used for. Um, as I say, this is the best preserved example. We found uh, another group of them uh, at a place called Glanrid Bridge. Uh, in most cases, the pipeline crossed straight across stream crossings at right angles, uh, which is the preferred method for doing it uh, from an engineering point of view. Uh, at Glanrid Bridge, it actually ran alongside the stream for about 200 metres before crossing. I'm not sure why that was just the uh, the tech uh, the um, the uh, engineering requirement. Uh, because of that, it actually exposed several uh, burnt mounds. I think about eight or nine, uh, and there would have been more potentially m you know, more beyond the uh, the area where the uh, pipeline ran. We were we were able to excavate those very carefully and radiocarbon date them, and incredibly, they were in use successively. Um, for at least 1500 years. So 1,500 years, if you compare that to the life of a, of a village, you know, how, how many villages can claim to be that old? Not, not many really, if any. So it's a, an astonishingly long duration that people are coming back and doing whatever it is that they're doing at these sites. We don't know. Um, so I'm gonna move into the Iron Age now. Um, if we were talking about the Iron Age in Gloucester, we'd be looking at um, enclosed and unenclosed sites with <coughs> huge amounts of pottery, um, a lot of them continuing uh, into Romano-British times as farmsteads. Um, we're in Wales and unfortunately um, in the Iron Age you get very little pottery and it gets less and less the further west you go. Um, that's not to imply any sort of cultural poverty. In fact, the, um, the landscape's absolutely covered in Iron Age settlements. They're all, um, all you know, pretty much all hilltops uh, uh, enclosures. Uh, it's just that they're using, instead of pottery, they're, they're using sort of organic containers, boiled leather perhaps, or, or wood, or a mixture of, of those. And, and generally speaking, they just don't survive in the archaeological record. Um, so pretty much all the, uh, the settlement known in the area of the pipeline before we excavated were, were hilltop enclosures, um, ranging from hill forts to smaller enclosures relating to farmsteads. <clears throat> Um, we found a new example of those at uh, Conkland Hill in Pembrokeshire. Um, there's an aerial photograph of it there. Uh, the aerial photograph was taken a few years after the uh, pipeline was excavated. The pipeline, you can probably just make it out along here. It's this sort of yellow line here. And then you can see the crop marks of the outer enclosure and some inner enclosure ditches here. So we just, uh, we just, skirted the edge of it. It was completely unknown before we, uh, we, we did the pipeline investigations. And as I say, following on from them during a particularly good summer, um, the, uh, the site was uh, photographed from, from an aircraft and got these really good uh, crop marks. So it's all there for somebody to excavate at some point. Um, and we found there that there, there was Iron Age settlement, as you'd expect. Um, there, there were also unexpected remains uh, for the early medieval period, which we'll talk about uh, later on. And this is this is just one hill. Along the next hill, there's another hill fort, and along the next hill, there's another one, and so on. It is very densely populated by these, these sort of structures. Here's another one a bit further along at Penny Krug. We didn't excavate that. That was a known uh, monument. The pipeline was rooted around it, but um, we what we did find were uh, the remains of three post-built Iron Age roundhouses is one of them. Um, and this was an unenclosed settlement as far as we could tell, with the caveat that the pipeline is only 20 meters wide. And these unenclosed settlements are very rare finds in Wales. Most people 
certainly based on current archaeological knowledge, most people lived in uh, these unenclosed hilltopping um, settlements, uh, these enclosed hilltop settlements, such as Pennycrug, just above there. Interestingly, this is the site where we found, uh, also found a, a Neolithic house. So the, the post holes of these Iron Age roundhouses look almost identical to the, um, to the Neolithic ones. Um, we were able to pick them apart by careful analysis. The, um, the Iron Age ones were dated where they contained uh, charred remains. They were able to be radiocarbon dated. Um, the Neolithic ones also contained charred remains and some contained pottery. So we were able to uh, pick apart the, uh, the two ground plans. It could have been coincidence. Maybe, you know, it's just a, just a, a pure coincidence that you've got a Neolithic site and then, a, and then an Iron Age site. Um, or it could be that the location was uh, attractive, you know, it's sheltered beneath that hill, it's got great views over the valley, which is practical and also aesthetic as well. Um, or it could be, you know, deeper, deeper um, cultural memories, which, uh, which we're unaware of. Uh, interestingly, and perhaps even more significantly, we found round Iron Age roundhouses up on Minif Mudfai. So this sort of curve here is an eave strip gully, and it's one of two, the other one was uh, attached to it. So they were sort of contemporary houses um, right up on the top of Minif Mudfai, so well above the, uh, the, the levels that are currently habited. Um, and looking at all the test spits that we dug across Minif Mudfai, so um, if you remember one of the earlier slides, people standing up on top of the hill digging holes, they dug, they dug uh, 300 plus test pits and sampled all the soil or sieved all the soil, took samples from them, and we found uh, charcoal of uh, of the Iron Age period that was radiocarbon dated, showing that there was a more widespread activity than just these uh, just these roundhouses. But what we also found that was that uh, there was peat development above these roundhouses that again was radiocarbon dated, that showed sort of in the later Iron Age Roman period and then through into the modern period, you had peat formation, and it looks like a mixture of um, climatic deterioration and uh, an over use of the uh, the soils there um, led people to abandon the, these upland settlements. And that brings us on to the, uh, the Roman conquest. So we have to remember this is Wales and we're talking about uh, a slightly later conquest than, uh, than in um, Britain. Um, from, uh, at least uh, one of the legions probably went from Gloucester into, into South Wales. And they used, uh, they used a network of these, these roads. Here's a section here providing an all weather net, uh, network of roads linking forts, fortlets and settlements. And, uh, you know, uh, the Roman army 2000 years ago knew, knew that uh, logistics and supply and protecting those was very important. Um, some more recent armies perhaps might learn a lesson or two there. I don't know, uh, hopefully not. Um, so we found road sections relating to this, this expansion into Wales. We also found um, a class of feature known as crop drying ovens, or sometimes called field kilns or, or corn dryers. Um, they, you, you get them from the, the sort of later Iron Age onwards, but uh, generally speaking, they, they're very common in the Roman period uh, and medieval period. And we, we certainly found Roman, plenty of Roman and uh, medieval examples. I'll talk a bit more about them when we come to the uh, medieval period. Um, but the, the point here is that they, uh, they probably reflect uh, an increased agricultural intensification. So people are now, um, the, the, the Roman army and the Roman settlements are, are taking on a lot of food from the, uh, the, ag uh, from the uh, surrounding farmlands. <clears throat> and, and down here, we're back to the, uh, the henge at Vena, so this late Neolithic henge that had been partially slighted in the, uh, in the Chalcolithic or early Bronze Age. It still survived. Um, we know from radiocarbon dating uh, some of the upper levels that it still survived as, a, as an earthwork with the banks and ditches still present. And, and interestingly, there was a four post structure. So we found four post holes on a settlement site. We'd, we'd probably say that was a, uh, a raised granary, you know, sort of thing that you might see uh, on a medieval, post medieval site on these sort of mushroom, uh, sort of stone mushroom posts um, to keep grain above the ground and airflow to keep it to keep it dry. Um, here it probably has more of a, a ritual connotation. 
Uh, and that's again suggested by uh, some nearby pits also within the henge, uh, which contained um, the remains of a couple of lambs or goats, uh, um, adult and, and kids. So um, we, you know, we can't prove that this is a sort of ritual going on, but it doesn't look like settlement. It looks like uh, uh, perhaps um, you've got you've got reuse of the henge in the um, in the sort of late Iron Age, uh, around about the time of the uh, the Roman conquest. And we we commissioned several reconstruction drawings. Um, here's here's one done by uh, done by uh, Matt Gridley, who's a, a an archaeological illustrator, a freelance. And I, I gave him a very detailed uh, brief right down to, you know, even the, the clouds, the, the landscape behind is all based on archaeological evidence from the pipeline. So sort of wooded valleys and, and by now the, the wild wood of those sort of Mesolithic and Neolithic times is almost, almost entirely cleared. And you've got a sort of grazed and uh, an arable landscape, um, grazed, so grazed up in the, the higher ground where the, the henge is located. And, uh, and I speculated here, you know, here you're into the realms of uh, speculation that there was a, a period of stress and they've revisited this henge um, to, to undertake these, these rituals, who you knows, sacrifice or, or what have you. But it's, uh, it's really nice to see these, these old monuments being reused you know, many, many years later, just, just as we visit Stonehenge and, uh, and Avebury ourselves. Uh, and now we're into the, uh, the early medieval period. And I, I mentioned these crop drying ovens. Uh, here's what they look like on the ground, very unspectacular, usually a sort of shallow scrape in the ground, sometimes with a bit of scorching, um, usually only sort of really evidenced by, by sort of charred cereal remains. So the remains of the cereal grains themselves and, and the chaff, which we can then uh, uh, investigate. We can identify the types of cereals and we can radiocarbon date them. We thought this one was a, a Bronze Age trough because it was located on a, a Bronze Age burnt mound, another one of these burnt mounds. There, there is a Bronze Age trough. Sometimes these burnt mounds have several troughs. So uh, naturally we thought this one was another example. It looked exactly the same. There's no, no difference between the two but um, it is absolutely securely early medieval. We took several samples and radiocarbon dated them. So it looks like in the early medieval period, the, the mound sort of manifested itself as a sort of drier area of ground in what was probably quite a wet area. There's a stream just to the north and these, these sort of lines here are actually old paleo channels, which might, might still have been damp then. So there, the, um, again, um, ancient sites being revisited in the past, in this case for um, use as a, a crop dryer. And here's another of our reconstruction drawings. This is set slightly later in the uh, medieval period. Uh, and it, it sort of demonstrates how these things work. If you harvest in a uh, harvest cereals in a temperate climate, you do have to dry them out, otherwise they'll be damp when you store them and they'll germinate them. And you also have to um, heat them again prior to milling, uh, otherwise they'll just turn to mush. So if you want a decent flour, you have to sort of parch them. Um, this shows the, the initial sort of drying stage, which is carried out um, back in sort of medieval and post-medieval into historic times in uh, the edges of at the edges of fields. So sometimes they're called field ovens. So close to the, um, close to the harvest, so you've got teams of <coughs> um, people from the farm. This, this shows a farm that we actually found along the pipeline, a medieval farm. Um, so the teams from there and perhaps sort of hired labourers as well, gathering in the harvest. Uh, the crops winnowed and then it's brought to this oven. We've shown it with a clay superstructure here, but um, many of them would have just been sort of simple open pits and you'd have had a, a rack above. Um, fuel wood would have been gathered from the, from the hedgerows and of course locating it in the fields means that you can then easily transport it to the farm or to the monastery or the town where the grain's then being stored uh, ready for use. Uh, and we found lots of them, lots of these uh, early medieval and medieval crop drying ovens and that really points to agricultural intensification. It's a period of, uh, of rising population <coughs> up until the uh, sort of late 13th, early 14th century. And of course, um, you know, the needs of the state and the church mean that uh, 
there, there are taxes that need to be paid in kind as well. So that stimulates uh, agricultural uh, um, intensification and, and you know changing methods, changing ways of doing things. Um, we also saw another site being revisited. So that um, that hill fort at Conkland, where we uh, we just excavated the edge of of one um, newly discovered hill fort, we found. Uh, uh, again, another sort of star discovery, a sunken floored building, a big square building about 10 metres across, um, radiocarbon dated to the early medieval period and associated with metalworking. Um, a very rare discovery. Uh, the only parallels were actually uh, also found in Pembrokeshire a few years ago. Uh, and again, they were, they were um, associated with, with metalworking. Um, so again, and these, uh, these, these ancient sites were being revisited in the past, which I think is very interesting. And then uh, that brings us into historic times, uh, a period that's quite often overlooked, but we found uh, uh, a lot of stuff uh, and a lot of it very interesting. Um, part of the pipeline went through a woods, Caniston Woods. <coughs> um, it's now a conifer plantation, but in historic times, it would have been uh, more mixed um, and it would have been managed woodland it's um, it's actually mentioned in, in Welsh medieval texts, so we, we know it's an old forest. Um, we found all sorts there from um, burnt mounds or almost ubiquitous features um, through to medieval uh, uh, routeways uh, and these post medieval charcoal clamps. Now, if you've ever, ever read uh, Swallows and Amazons, uh, they're referred to there and I've been uh, traveling through um, Hungary through the woods there and they, they still use them there and of course in the, the Forest of Dean as well. Um, uh, basically what you're doing here is you're, you're um, taking coppiced wood, so poles of wood, stacking it there, covering, covering it in turfs and when you light it it burns in a, a, a very slowly to produce charcoal which is, is great for industrial purposes and there was actually a, a forge in the woods in historic times which is uh, just shown in the background of this this picture here. Um, so we found we found numerous of these. I don't know a dozen or so of these charcoal clamps. In terms of archaeology, they just survive as a slight terrace into the ground. You can see the um, workers here have terraced into the ground and a, and a spread of charcoal. But the charcoal is um, it's possible to radiocarbon date it. And of course, um, look at the species that were being managed and and even how how they were managing them. Were they coppicing them? And over over what sort of cycle were they coppicing them? Um, charcoal burners themselves, the people who, who did these were regarded with quite some suspicion by, by locals. They, they tended to move around a lot. Um, and so they were, you know, they were always strangers. They lived in, they lived in the woods. They, you know, they looked different. They smelt different. They lived in these little, these little huts here. This, this hut here, which is uh, taken from a historic image, a, a photograph, uh, bears a remarkable sort of similarity to, uh, um, uh, speculated reconstruction of a Mesolithic hunter-gatherer hut from from Britain. You know, they they, they would have been very different for everybody else. So uh, you know, they're regarded with a lot of suspicion. And it's a, just a reminder that all sorts of people inhabited um, the uh, the route of the pipeline in the past. Uh, another type of feature we found with it was this saw pit. So we found a couple of those. So deep pits where you've been there. Uh, um, soaring up much larger timbers, so you know, uh, pit props, um, structural timbers, that sort of thing. And then we also found uh, these these um, brick kilns, so kilns for producing bricks, but also lined, so for for thermal reasons, lined with bricks. These were close to a a manor house. Um, the existing manor house is uh, is, I believe, post medieval, um, so it's you know fairly fairly recent. But uh, the older kiln and the older bricks being manufactured were medieval and there was a medieval manor house there. It was, um, it was owned by uh, one of the winning side in the, in the Wars of the Roses. Somebody managed somehow to back the right horse and uh, bricks really were just sort of coming into fashionable use again after the Roman period at about that time. So, uh, you know, the, it's a, there's a nice link there between, you know, the end of the Wars of the Roses, which sort of, you know, mark the end of the medieval period and this this new sort of way of decorating your manor house it would be great if the, the manor house was there and we were able to relate the, the products of the kiln to the manor house, but uh, sadly, all gone. So 
So that really brings us to the uh, the end of the talk. I've, I've just included these two last slides. Um, obviously, there are some of the archaeologists from the team uh, who excavated along the, uh, I think that's from the central section on, on Mudfire again. Um, this is uh, one of the post-medieval sites that we excavated, <coughs> um, the remains of a farmhouse. We, we found it during the evaluation stage and the pipeline was rerouted around it. It survived only at foundation level below the ground, um, but Duffield Archaeological Trust a few years later as a, 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 um, a an outreach community dig um, excavated it and then did some research into the farmer house itself and uh, and found this picture of it. It had um, been destroyed by fire and here the, the family and some sort of local people, some of them you know, rather smartly dressed with a big pail, um, attempting to sort of put out the fire or, or salvage it uh, and we found we found the remains of that there <clears throat> along with uh, more more crop drying ovens so it's just a, a nice I thought it was a nice link uh, of uh, you know, across the years you've got the uh, the modern archaeologists uh, several of whom helped first identify this site and then uh, the people in the historic photograph uh, and up there there's the link if you want to look at any of the reports in more detail uh, that's the link there uh, thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, uh, John. That was fantastic. Um, quite a lot of information there to take in uh, from yes. a wide range of dates and sites. <laughs> Try, trying to condense it into <laughs> into oh, oh, 50 minutes not, an hour. <laughs> not surprisingly, over 300 kilometres or more. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, you must have spent an absolute fortune on uh, radio carbon dating. You, uh, yes. Hopefully, hopefully you get better prices than we do when we do one or two. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But you have to tell us the secret. Yeah, well, <laughs> threats. Um, okay, well, uh, see if there's any um, questions from the audience in the room here to start with, and then we'll go around the uh, Zoom people and see if there's any there coming in. So, uh, firstly, anyone in the room got any questions for John? They're all looking very studious. Oh, uh, <laughs> there's a question from Mike. What size are the what size are the roundhouses in your in your Bronze Age site? Ooh, put me on the spot there. Um, the Bronze Age site. Do, do you mean the, the Iron Age site? The one near Penny Krug? Or do you have one with a drip trench? Ah, oh, yeah, they, they were the Iron Age ones up at Minif Mudfai. Um, I think it was about eight or nine metres. Uh, any other questions in the room? Uh, thanks, John. That was really interesting. Um, on the Minith Mudfai um, settlement that you you found, that was you said that, that was quite early in in the Iron Age. At what stage did it um, did it start to peat over? Do you think is it? it and is that that you say that's a sign of sort of climatic deterioration, most probably, or yeah, yeah. That that seemed to be the conclusion of the uh, the environmental team. Um, their monograph, I think, is still forthcoming. Um, so there's going to be a very detailed monograph on the environmental results. But certainly the impression at, at the moment is that it, it starts peating over in the later Iron Age period and the Roman period. And we didn't we certainly didn't find any Roman settle, settlement remains up there. And the, uh, that peat then continues to form right into the modern period. Okay, well, looking at the um, uh, Zoomers, uh, there's a couple of hands up. Um, Sophie, did you have a question? Not like, no. Um, and Jeanette, no, sorry, uh, that was from the meeting earlier, I think. Okay, no <laughs> problem. Uh, Jeanette's got a hand up. Jeanette, did you have a question? Probably not. <laughs> 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 okay anybody else um up there we can see all those can't we so. okay well looks looks so like that's it john excellent so you've stunned thought... you've, st you've stunned them into silence <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> hopefully i've given so much information everybody knows everything they need to but absolutely, more likely yeah. i've stunned them into silence <laughs> absolutely yeah Okay, well, um, if there's no more questions. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us, John. Oh, pleasure. Appreciate your appreciate your time in prepar preparing it. Sorry, you couldn't bring the books that we could buy, but uh, maybe another time. Yeah. <laughs> yes.
uh, we'll we'll find a second talk for next year and you could bring them then <laughs> yes yes well we've got a really nice site at Quedgley well Haresfield which uh, uh, be I was going right to I was going to mention Haresfield yeah that sounds yeah. interesting yeah great yeah okay. yeah it's a cracking site actually <laughs> yeah fantastic anyway thank you very much for your time and uh, well good luck getting the car getting the car fixed. <laughs> <laughs>